Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Harnessing the Power of TNT 11 Plex Sample Multiplexing and Improved Phosphopeptide Enrichment to Gain New Insight into Signaling Pathways, presented by Dr. Ryan Baumgarten, a senior R&D staff scientist in protein and cell analysis at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm Susie Valdez, and I will be your moderator for this educational webcast presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during this presentation. Just click on that green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window and type your questions into the box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Please also notice that you are viewing the poster in a slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. <clears throat> if you have trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the support button at the top right of the presentation or use the Q&A button to let us know that you are having a problem. Good news, this presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the button in the lower left and follow that process for obtaining your credits. Without further ado, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Baumgarten. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Today I will be presenting on some improved reagents and workflows for sample multiplexing and phospheptide enrichment for mass spectrometry-based proteomic analysis. I would like to begin with an overview of today's presentation and some of the challenges that are faced by proteomic researchers and biologists using mass spectrometry to study complex protein samples. Then I will present on different strategies to overcome some of these challenges. Some of the strategies that I will cover in depth include the use of tandem mass tag reagents to combine multiple samples into a single LCMS analysis. In addition, I will present on recent improvements in LCMS sample preparation, including phosphopeptide enrichment strategies, peptide fractionation using high pH reverse phase chromatography, and new peptide quantitation assays for sample normalization. And finally, I will show some work combining these technologies into an integrated workflow to simultaneously, simultaneously identify and quantify tens of thousands of phosphopeptide changes across multiple biological sample conditions. One of the major challenges faced by biologists interested in mass spectrometry-based proteomic experiments is that a majority of the proteomic researchers are focused on protein identification and characterization. As such, the instrument methods, the instruments and methods available for proteomic analysis using mass spectrometry can most readily provide information about a protein sequence and its various isoforms, including a wide variety of post-translational modifications, but do not provide much insight into complex biological systems. This is because the analysis of a single sample or condition only provides a snapshot of the proteome. In order to better understand functional biology of a system or organism, we need to move beyond protein identification and begin to monitor changes in protein abundance, interactions, structure, and multiple samples in numerous conditions. Only through more comprehensive analysis of protein expression and dynamics will we be able to understand alterations to the proteome over time or in response to disease, stimuli, or environmental cues. Western blots are one of the key tools for assessing protein changes among numerous samples and conditions. This powerful technique enables biologists to study specific proteins but it can be difficult to find good antibodies verified for high specificity and low cross-reactivity for all protein isoforms. In addition, Western blots only show a limited number of target proteins and post-translational modifications. Therefore, key biological changes may be missed if they're not probed for. So how do you see what other changes are happening in the rest of the proteome? Liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, or LCMS, workflow is one technology that enables global profiling of the proteome. Most protein biology researchers are familiar with the typical Western blot workflow, which includes in-gel based separation, transfer, and detection of proteins using primary and secondary antibodies, followed by imaging for data analysis. Mass spectrometry is similar as we separate proteomic samples with HPLC, detect proteins and peptides with a mass spectrometer, but typically analyze raw data 
post detection with software. Although Western blotting has not changed much in the past 35 years, the barriers to adoption of LCMS as an analytical tool to study proteins has significantly decreased over the past decades through improved instrumentation and software. However, unlike, un unlike other spectro spectroscopy techniques such as absorbance or fluorescence, MS is not inherently quantitative. Quantitation of complex samples using MS is especially challenging due to the wide dynamic range of protein abundance, which, can significantly, uh, which is significantly greater than the instrument. The sensitivity limits of instrumentation, which are different for various LTMS systems, and the ionization suppression from interfering substances and co peptides. And finally, incomplete analysis of the sample due to instrument methods such as DDA or the low number measurements based on the MS duty cycle. However, there are some solutions which can make mass spec one of the most sensitive and quantitative analytical techniques. One of the methods to reduce some complexity is through fractionation, depletion, or enrichment, which makes it more palatable and easier to identify low abundant peptides and proteins. Another is to use internal standards labeled with stable isotopes to accurately quantify the analytes. Although sample fractionation is required for more comprehensive analysis of complex proteomes, it leads to significantly more samples to ultimately analyze by LTMS. Shown here is a typical sample fractionation of phosphopeptide enrichment workflow, where each sample is separated into 12 individual fractions. Assuming four hours of instrument time per fraction, it will take a total of 48 hours to analyze these 12 fractions. So to perform this analysis to study 10 different sample conditions, it would actually take approximately 20 days, which is nearly three weeks of instrument time, and that is without considering replicate injection. As mentioned previously, another method to improve MS quantitation is to use isotopically labeled internal standards or to label the samples themselves with stable isotopes. For discovery MS analysis, there are numerous ways to label samples with stable isotopes. SILAC is a metabolic labeling approach where heavy amino acids are used to incorporate stable isotopes into expressed proteins. ICAT, ITRAC, and TMT are all chemical labeling approaches which use stable isotope containing reagents to covalently label peptides, and proteins. Unlike MS and targeted MS analysis, such as PRM or SRM, which use heavy peptides for quantitation, these metabolic and chemical tagging methods are used to label one sample as a reference channel for relative quantitation of one or more additional samples in the same LTMS analysis run. However, these labeling approaches, um, excuse me, however, of these labeling approaches, only isobaric tags such as ITRAC and TMT can be used to quantify proteins from multiple samples without increasing complexity at the MS level. ITRAC, which is the isobaric tag for relative absolute quantitation, and TMT, or better known as the TANA mass tag, are both isobaric mass tags which covalently label peptides on their amino termini and lysine side chains. Shown here is a schematic of a peptide with the TMT tag on the end terminus. These reagents are designed that such upon fragmentation during tandem spec, it generates a peptide sequence ion. They also liberate a unique reporter ion in the lower mass region of the MS spectrum. By combining multiple tags together, the reporter ions can be used as a barcode, not only to identify which sample the peptide originated from, but also for relative quantitation of the peptide among different samples. In addition to enabling relative quantitation, sample multiplexing has many advantages. First and most importantly, combining multiple biological samples before fractionation greatly reduces instrument analysis time, which increases throughput. Secondly, performing a single LCMS analysis of different samples from independent experiments increases the overlap among replicates, leading to fewer missing protein identification and quantitative values. Another advantage is that one of the channels can be used as an internal control to verify method performance or as a reference channel to compare data across multiple runs. And finally, higher multiplexing results that enable more comprehensive experimental design, which can incorporate more replicates, more samples, such as those from a dose response curves or time course experiments. Shown here on the left is the schematic of the TMT tag structure. As described previously, these isobaric tags consist of an amine reactive NHS ester which covalently reacts with peptides and protein primary amino groups, and an MS cleavable linker and a mass reporter ring. On the right, 
is the TMT Sixplex Isobaric Reagent Set. Each TMT tag has the same overall mass, but differ in the specific location of incorporated heavy atoms, as indicated by the asterisk on the structure, relative to the cleavage site. Thus, TMT-labeled peptides behave identically in the mass spec, but as the linkers are cleaved during MS-MS fragmentation, they liberate mass reporter ions of different masses, which can be used for relative quantitation. In 2012, a change in the manufacturing of the TMT reagent reporter ions from a heavy carbon to a heavy nitrogen resulted in isotope variants, which were resolved using high-resolution orbit trap mass spectrometers. This is due to a very small 6 millimass, 6 millidalton mass difference in the neutron of stable 13C and 15N isotopes. This finding resulted in the development of an extension of the TMT multiplexing reagent set from 6 to 11. Shown here is the complete set of TMT reagents, which includes a fully isobaric tenplex set of reagents and the newly released TMT11131C, which can be used to extend the sample multiplexing up to an 11plex. As you can see from the reporter ion masses, there are very small differences in weight that can be measured using high mass only by using high-resolution mass spectrometry. The TMT tags can be used to label up to 11 different samples in a protein digest. After TMT labeling, samples are equally mixed together before peptide fractionation and LCMS analysis. Since the tags have the same nominal mass, the labeled peptides appear as one sample during MS but split into 11 different reporter ions during tandem mass spec for n peptide sequencing. However, there is an issue when quantifying isobaric tagged peptides in unfractionated complex protein digest mixtures using TMT or ITRAC reagents. Since isobaric tag reporter ions are measured after pep peptide fragmentation during MSMS, if there's co-isolation of an abundant precursor with target peptides, it can result in interferences in the reporter ion region, distorting ratios during quantitation. Even when using narrow isolation windows, co-isolation of an interfering peptide still presents a challenge to accurate quantitation using isobaric tags. If the contaminating peptide is also labeled, the resulting ACD MS2 spectra contains reporter ions from both the target and the precursor, uh, distorting the quantitation uh, that is reported from the true value. Uh, this results in a marked decrease in both the accuracy and the precision depending on the degree of interference. The real change in protein expression, which is shown in blue, therefore becomes masked under reporter ion signals from those of the contaminated peptides denoted in red. Ultimately, this can lead to a bias in the relative quantitation ratios resulting in lower fold changes that are less accurate if the interference is more abundant. But interference can be reduced and even eliminated with the proper sample preparation, LC gradients, and instrument methods. This experiment demonstrates the effect of improved peptide separations and the new SPS MS to the third instrument method on reducing potential parent ion co-interference. As shown in the top graph, 500 femtomoles of BSA or bovine serum albumin uh, was labeled with TMT tenplex in a ratio of 16 to 8 to 4 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 and was then spiked into a complex matrix consisting of 500 nanograms of HeLa digest that is labeled with only eight of the TMT tags that were equally mixed one-to-one -one for all channels. The lower graph is the observed BSA TMT reporter ion ratio. As you can see, the channels for 128N and 130N, which are free of interference, show accurate ratios regardless of the LT gradient length and instrument method. However, channels with more high abundant interference such as 128C, show less precision and accuracy. However, the use of SPS MS to the third, as shown in the lighter blue bars in the graph, nearly eliminates interferon ions from the complex HeLa background, which were co-isolated with the BSA peptide parent ions. This offers the best possible accuracy and precision of the method shown. So what is the SPS MS to the third method? This is a novel method only available on the Orbitrap Fusion and Lumos Tribid mass spectrometers. These systems have the ability to perform what's called synchronous precursor selection, or SPS. This process involves selecting multiple MS2 precursors after low energy CID fragmentation using a single waveform for subsequent higher energy HCD MS3 fragmentation to generate the TMT reporter ions. 
This method dramatically increases the signal intensity of the reporter ions while removing co-eluting interfering ions. The increase in reporter population improves the ratio accuracy due to better counting statistics at the same time boost the sensitivity limit of the peptide quantification. The advantage of this can be observed using a specifically designed TMT quantification standard. This standard consists of three different yeast strains that have a single gene knockout labeled in triplicate with TMT templex reagents as shown in the reporter ion bar graph at the bottom of the screen. Using this standard, one can clearly see the interference which results in less precision and accuracy when using traditional ACB MS2 methods shown in the upper left compared to the SPS MS3 method on the upper right. Overall, the SPS MS3 method results in better measurements which show more enhanced differences. Shown here are the full change in expression of 12 different signaling proteins in H358 parental carcinoma cells versus an allotinib resistant strain. As you can see, the overall trend of upper down regulation is the same for both standard ACD MS2 methods compared to the SPS MS3 method, but in the SPS MS3 there are much larger differences. This enhancement can result in fewer false negatives, meaning more significantly regulated proteins can be identified in complex proteomic samples. Lastly, although label-free quantitation can be used to quantify large differences in protein abundances, TMT reagent-based quantitation is nearly twofold more precise, with CVs typically less than 8% among replicates. This precision allows one to detect smaller significant differences among samples. Combined with other advantages I've described, including higher sample throughput and fewer missing quantitative values between runs, isobaric labeling is a clear choice for quantifying protein changes among samples in the least amount of time. Now that I've introduced the TANA mass tag reagents for sample multiplexing and quantitation, I would like to talk about additional ways to improve mass spec sample preparation upstream of sample labeling. Unlike Westerblatting, which has minimum sample preparation before SDS page analysis, proteomic samples require lysis, reduction, alkylation, digestion, and cleanup before LCMS analysis. These additional processing steps can introduce more variability among samples, which contribute to decreased reproducibility and poor quantitative measurements. In addition, digestion of proteins to peptides for bottom-up proteomic analysis greatly increases the sample complexity which results in no or poor sequence coverage for low abundant proteins. So how do you reduce sample complexity? Well, there are a lot of techniques that can be used to separate proteins, such as protein fractionation by size, charge, or cellular location, or removal of abundant proteins by immunodepletion. Other techniques can be used to fractionate or enrich targets at the peptide level. For highly abundant proteins, further sample preparation is typically not required as they are easily identified with simple protein digestion. However, for medium and low abundance proteins, one or more of these techniques will be required so that these rarer species are detected by mass spec. The rest of the presentation will focus on improvements to phosphopeptide enrichment, fractionation, and normalization before LTMS analysis. The first technique that I would like to introduce, which will be used to reduce sample complexity, is phosphopeptide enrichment. Detection of phosphopeptides is extremely difficult in complex protein digests, as they typically represent less than 1% of the total peptides in the sample. And abundant unmodified peptides that dominate the LCMS spectrum can suppress the signal of the low abundant phosphopeptides, leading to poor detection. Although there are some chromatography techniques that can partially enrich phosphorylated peptides and proteins, the most common methods enrich modified peptides through affinity to the negatively charged phosphate groups. These include immobilized metal affinity chromatography, or IMAC, uh, an example would be the iron NTA, or metal oxide affinity chromatography, or MAOC, an example being titanium dioxide. And lastly, there are some phospho-specific antibodies that can be used for affinity chromatography, such as the phosphotyrosine antibody for new amino enrichment. Recently, we launched two new improved phosphopeptide enrichment kits based on iron IMAC and titanium dioxide phosphopeptide affinity that have dramatically improved selectivity, ease of use, and yield. The iron NTA kit contains 30 spin columns, a binding wash buffer, and phosphopeptide elution buffer. 
The titanium dioxide kit contains 24 spin tips and a binding equilibration buffer to block nonspecific binding of unmodified peptides in addition to a wash buffer and elution buffer. Compared to the legacy kits, these new kits have dramatically simplified protocols with new pre-formulated buffers. Specifically, the iron NTA kit reduced the number of protocol steps from seven to three by using an optimized loading and wash buffer, which resulted in higher binding specificity. On the lower panel, you can see that the titanium dioxide kit eliminated the hazardous pyrrolidine elution buffer in addition to the graphite cleanup columns, which also led to improved yields. Unfortunately, phosphate groups are not the only negatively charged functional groups found on peptides, so there can be significant nonspecific binding of unmodified peptides to these affinity resins. Specifically, carboxylic acid groups found on acidic amino acids and the peptide C-termini can compete for binding, reducing the specificity and the enrichment yield. This is especially true for titanium dioxide resins, which typically require a blocking buffer containing lactic acid or other organic acid to reduce nonspecific binding. As shown in the graph, we have significantly improved the binding specificity of both resins to greater than 95%. In addition, our IMAT kit can enrich up to 150 micrograms of phosphopeptides from 5 milligrams of mammalian cell culture protein digest, nearly tripling the yield of the previous kit. Our reformulated elution buffers are also mass spec compatible and can remove by speedback, which eliminates the lead to further clean up these samples using offline C18 desalting or trap columns which in turn can also sometimes result in the loss of the more hydrophilic phosphopeptide species. Even with these dramatic improvements in phosphopeptide enrichment, iron NTA and titanium dioxide enrich slightly different phosphopeptides. As shown in the Venn diagram, you can see that there's a less than a 50% overlap in unique phosphopeptide identifications using iron IMAC versus titanium dioxide enrichment. Therefore, the Larsen Group in Denmark developed a sequential elution from IMAC or SIMAC method to capture more phosphopeptides from the same sample. In this method, the unbound phosphopeptides from the iron NTA resin are subsequently enriched using a second titanium dioxide spin column. Unfortunately, uh, due to the buffers and the binding capacity of the resins that are in our kits, the SIMAC method did not provide more phosphopeptides uh, compared to the iron, to, compared to the SIMAC method. Therefore, we developed the inverse of the SIMAC method, which we call the SMOKE method, which uses titanium dioxide before iron NTA for sequential enrichment of phosphopeptides. As you can see here, the iron NTA enrichment of titanium flow through resulted in greater than 13,000 unique phosphopeptides. For native phosphopeptides that are enriched with SMOKE, uh, and shown on the Venn diagram on the left, we only had a 22% overlap of titanium dioxide alone. Importantly, the SMOKE method identified an additional 8,000 unique phosphopeptides on top of the 14,000 peptides from titanium dioxide alone. We also found that the SMOKE method works well for TNT-labeled phosphopeptides, with 39% more unique phosphopeptides identified using SMOKE versus titanium alone. In total, we identified over, over 21,000 unique phosphopeptides using the SMOKE method versus only 16,800 with the SIMAC method as for phospho with phosphopeptide enrichment from one milligram of nicotazole-treated HeLa cell digest. As shown in the graph on the left, using titanium dioxide alone, we identified approximately 6,000 monophosphorylated peptides, 4,700 multiply phosphorylated peptides, and approximately 1,100 non-phosphorylated peptides. Further, after enrichment of the flow through and wash fractions using iron NTA, the smoke method enriched in a, over 10,000 phosphopeptides, which were mostly monophosphorylated with greater than 95% specificity. In contrast, when we use the SIMAC method with these columns, with our resins and buffers, and it enriched less than 2,000 additional phosphopeptides, and of these, only 50% of them were specific. Therefore, the SMOKE method enriches more total phosphopeptides than SIMAC when using the high select kits. The advantage of the SMOKE method is shown here, where, the, where there is an average of 25% additional phosphopeptides were identified in over 70 signaling pathways that we profiled. For some pathways, such as DNA replication and focal adhesion, no phosphopeptides were identified using titanium dioxide alone. But after the SMOKE method, we were able to identify phosphopeptides from these proteins and these pathways. 
Therefore, the smoke method is recommended for higher phosphoproteome coverage, especially when the sample is limited. As mentioned earlier, sample complexity is a key challenge to detect a key challenge for detecting low abundant protein uh, and quantification. Offline separation of protein digests using strong cation exchange and high pH reverse phase chromatography have become popular methods to increase protein ad identifications. For SEX fractionation, samples need to be exchanged into a loading buffer for binding, and elution is typically performed with increasing concentrations of ammonium formate or salts, which require additional cleanup before LCMS analysis. In contrast, for high pH reverse rate fractionation, acidified protein digest can be loaded directly on the columns and eluted with increasing concentration of acetonitrile under basic conditions. Another advantage of the high pH reverse phase fractionation is that it's more orthogonal separation mode to the low pH chromatography used, for, used by analytical LCMS C18 columns. Here's the schematic of our high pH reverse phase spin column workflow. These convenient single-use spin columns can be used to fractionate up to 100 micrograms of protein digest in eight or more fractions, depending on the gradient. First, the columns are equilibrated before sample loading of the protein digest under low pH conditions. Then columns are washed to remove any salts and then equilibrated with a high pH buffer. Bound peptides are then eluted in a stepwise fashion using increasing concentrations of acetonitrile ranging from 5 to 50 percent under high pH or basic conditions. The orthogonality of the high pH fractionation can be observed in the chromatogram shown here. The top chromatogram is an LCMS chromatogram of an unfractionated HeLa cell protein digest. The middle chromatogram is a low pH acetonitrile fraction run on the same column. And then the bottom chromatogram is a high pH acetonitrile fraction processed using the high pH reverse phase spin kit. As you can see, the peptides prefractionated on the low pH mode in the middle panel are not distributed across the LCMS gradient, in contrast to the high pH mode in the lower panel. This distribution of peptides in the high pH fractionation mode results in better sampling during LCMS, leading to more peptide identification. Although these columns use a step gradient for elution of peptides, there is still excellent fractional resolution. Approximately 70% of each peptide is found in a single fraction, with less than 25% in more than one fraction. When comparing unique peptide identifications, you can also see there's comparatively low overlap observed among adjacent fractions. This results in more unique peptide identifications as the instrument is sampling fewer redundant peptides due to the lower complexity of the individual fractions. Peptide fractionation using these devices is also highly reproducible. Here are three separate chromatograms of the 12.5 acetonitrile fraction that were uh, processed using three individual spin columns. As you can see from the base group chromatograms, they are virtually identical. When looking at individual peptides from different proteins, we observed less than 10% variation in the relative intensity among replicates. This slide demonstrates the power of peptide fractionation to increase protein identification. The top graph shows the number of unique peptides identified in each high pH acetonitrile fraction. As you can see, there are very few peptides observed in the flow-through and wash fraction, indicative of nearly complete binding of the peptides to the spin column. Analysis of each high pH and acetonitrile elution fraction also shows high numbers of peptide and protein identifications in each fraction. Overall, these results combined represent almost a two-fold increase in the number of unique peptide and protein identifications seen in the light blue bars compared to those identified in an unfractionated sample in the green bars. Both phosphopeptide enrichment and high pH fractionation are part of a complete workflow for quantitative proteomic sample prep. This includes robust sample prep and digest of the protein samples, peptide fractionation, phosphopeptide enrichment, and peptide quantitation. Next, I would like to introduce some new peptide quantitation assays that can be used to normalize sample concentrations before TMT labeling and mixing and LCMS injection. We recently developed two new peptide assays to measure peptide concentrations from a wide variety of protein digests. As shown here, we have the thermoscientific fluor Pierce fluorometric peptide quantitation and the thermoscientific Pierce colorimetric peptide quantitation assay. The fluorescent or FPQ 
assay is a direct N-terminal labeling assay that uses a fluorescent dye to label the amino termini of all peptides in the sample. This rapid protein detection uh, reagent can detect uh, peptides in little as five minutes and are read in a fluorometer with uh, excitation of 390 nanometers with an emission of 475. Uh, this product is, uh, uh, can be used to detect complex uh, digests as well as individual peptides. In contrast, the colorimetric peptide assay uses indirect copper reduction and chelation chemistry, which is similar to microBCA. Because of this uh, chemistry, it requires a 30-minute incubation to develop the color and can be read on any microplate reader with UV vis filters or the nanodrop. Uh, this uh, assay, because of its indirect chemistry, can also be used to detect TMT-labeled peptide samples. The FBQ assay shows excellent linearity and sensitivity all the way down to five micrograms as shown in the graph on the right. In addition, the FBQ assay is significantly more sensitive than reading absorbance at 214 nanometers as shown in the table for standard BCA, uh, uh, BSA digest and bacitracin. The CPQ assay is also more linear than the microBCA over a greater dynamic range. In addition, as shown in the graph on the right, it, is nearly full, there's a, it has a nearly full-fold increase in signal to noise and sensitivity compared to the microBCA, which means that less peptide sample can be used in the assay. In fact, we typically use less than one microliter of triptych digest from a complex protein mixture at one microgram per microliter to measure the sample concentrations of our peptides. Since TNT labeling modifies the amino termini of peptides, labeled peptides will not produce a fluorescent signal in the FPQ assay as shown on the graph on the right. Therefore, the CPQ assay is preferred to quantify TNT labeled peptides before mixing. However, the FPQ assay can still be used to measure the concentration of unlabeled peptides or monitor protein digestion or confirm labeling efficiency post TNT labeling. To compare the protein concentration as measured by the colorimetric and fluorometric peptide assays, triptych digests were prepared from 12 different mammalian cell lines. Peptide digest concentrations were determined using both assay kits according to the instructions, and each sample was assayed in triplicate. As you can see in the graph, the concentration of each digest was calculated from a standard curve that was used from uh, digesting a protein digest standard. The peptide concentrations measured here are shown that each assay has high correlation with each other using complex mixtures despite having different chemistries. One of the biggest benefits of measuring peptide concentration after digestion at, or, before, or after peptide cleanup is that you can normalize the amount of peptide loaded onto the analytical LTMS column. This results in higher run-to-run -run reproducibility and can lead to more peptide identifications if they combined with optimized LTMS sample separation and instrument methods. In the last part of my presentation, I would like to show a recent application combining all of these technologies I've discussed so far. For this experiment, we wanted to monitor changes in phosphorylation in response to a wide variety of cell stimulations. Serum-starved A549 cells were stimulated with serum growth factors or treated with the mitotic inhibitor naconazole to activate different cellular growth or cell cycle arrest pathways. After treatment, samples were lysed, reduced, alkylated and digested before labeling with TMT Templex reagents. TMT11131C was used to label a portion of each sample to serve as a pooled reference channel for relative quantitation. After labeling, samples were combined before phosphopeptide enrichment using the SMOKE method and high pH reverse phase fractionation before LCMS analysis using the Orbitrap Fusion Lumos mass spectrometer with the SPS MS of the third method for data analysis. Here's one protein, RAF1, which is shown to be differentially regulated by phosphorylation in response to the different treatment conditions. Note that the three serine phosphocytes were quantified on this protein. The first site, serine-259, showed little change among the different treatments. However, serine-296 and 289 exhibited widely different regulation. These results highlight the power of this workflow to study phosphor signaling, especially for sites where phosphospecific antibodies may not be available. Overall, we were able to quantify over 42,000 unique peptides mapping to nearly 5,800 proteins. 
notably identified over 33,000 phosphopeptides and quantified nearly 24,000 phosphopeptides in 11 different samples. All of this data was acquired in less than 48 hours of LCMS instrument time and analyzed using Proteome Discoverer software for peptide identification, quantification, and phosphocyte localization. In summary, I hope that after this presentation, you have a better understanding of the strategies, reagents, and methods used to reduce sample complexity of proteomic samples without sacrificing quantitative accuracy, reproducibility, and instrument time. The combination of global profiling with improved MS sample prep reagents for phosphopeptide enrichment, fractionation, and normalization allows you to gain more insight into the more biological insight from complex samples. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would like to take any questions. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. I'd now like to start <clears throat> the Q&A live portion of our webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the, the green Q&A button on the lower left of the presentation window, type your questions into the box that appear on the screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started with our first questions from our audience members. Here's our first one, Dr. Baumgarten. Do you recommend combining the titanium dioxide and iron NTA fractions from the smoke method into a single MS sample run? That's a good question. Um, you can actually combine the two and run them in a single LCMS run. However, you will identify more unique phosphopeptides by running them separately. Uh, the advantage of the smoke method is that you can actually do a double enrichment uh, from the same sample. So instead of actually enriching the sample with individually through titanium and iron, which require twice as much sample, you can actually enrich uh, phosphopeptides using either technology from the same sample, especially if your sample is limited. So I recommend actually running them separately if possible. Thank you so much for that. We have a lot of great questions coming in. Here's our next one. How much sample is required for the TMT phosphopeptide workflow? Yeah, so one advantage of uh, the TMT technology is actually you're combining multiple samples together. We typically recommend uh, using about approximately one milligram of uh, uh, peptide digest for phosphopeptide enrichment. But with the TMT 10 plex or 10 plus 11, uh, you only need to label 100 micrograms of each uh, sample. And then when they're pooled together, you actually uh, have, enough fossil pep or have enough peptide material to do phosphopeptide enrichment. So what I typically recommend is for this workflow is to use 1 to 200 micrograms of peptide digest so that you can do the uh, phosphopeptide enrichment to get enough sample for LCMS analysis. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Here's our next question. An audience member would like to know, is there a way to multiplex samples beyond the 11? So unfortunately, uh, with the TMT reagents, we only have five stable isotopes, either on the linker or the rings. And with the uh, NNC uh, variants that we offer, we can only uh, have 11 different tags without changing the chemical structure of the reagents. Uh, there are some uh, reports in the literature of combining TMT labeling technology with SILAC, However, uh, the data analysis from these types of experiments is uh, quite challenging. That being said, there are uh, other reports of alternative structures that do enable higher multiplexing, but of course these tags uh, would be longer and may not uh, have the same fragmentation as the TNT tags. Wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> we have one more question coming in from our audience member. Which MS instruments can be used to analyze the TMT-11 samples? Yeah, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, the, the TMT reagents, especially the 11 plex, require high resolution orbit trap instruments. Uh, the TMT 6 plex reagents, which are the reporter ions are separated by uh, a single dolphin, those, can, those, in, those reagents can be uh, uh, analyzed using ion trap, QTOPs, as well as orbit traps. However, the millimass Dalton difference in the reporter ions of the 11 plex requires an orbit trap. Therefore, you can use uh, any orbit trap uh, based MS. So those would be examples of those include the QX active mass spectrometer, 
as well as the Orbitrap Fusion as well and the Orbitrap Lumos and the Orbitrap Elite. Thank you. We actually have one more question that came in. When does LCMS with tissue samples, are there additional sample preparation procedures that need to be included? Yeah, for tissue samples, um, especially ones that are highly vascularized, so they have a lot of blood content, uh, we recommend uh, trying to remove as much of the, uh, the blood as possible through extensive washing using a saline buffer. And then after that, uh, many tissues that are harder in nature, such as uh, kidney or heart or other muscle tissues, uh, we require that they uh, be uh, ground up, typically using a polytron or some type of bead beading or mechanical homogenization. Uh, but after that, the rest of the proteomic workflow is uh, basically identical to what we would do with for cultured cells. Uh, one caveat is with certain uh, tissues such as brain, which may contain uh, high lipid content, we do recommend uh, uh, either uh, solvent precipitation, such as methanol or acetone. And the reason for that is it actually removes an interfering lipids uh, that, are, that also have primary amines. And these lipids can also be labeled with TNT, and that reduces the peptide labeling efficiency. So for those t tissues in particular, we do recommend doing some type of solvent precipitation. Great, thank you. If there are no more questions, I'd once like to thank again Dr. Baumgarten for his presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and Thermo Fisher Scientific for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you in the next webinar. Have a great day.